And, and the whole idea of this filter, unfiltered series that we're jumping into is this idea that, that we live, just like on Instagram and on Facebook, like when, when, you, when a picture like, it doesn't look cool enough or it, like there, there's something that you don't want in it, you crop it out, like we filter our lives. We, we slap filters on to make things prettier, more round, our rough edges are smoother. We put, we put this, this fake front forward sometimes, but what, what really God desires for us is to have this unfiltered life where it's really not about the perception and the persona and the, the, the Facebook uh, comparisons, but that we can be open and honest about our raw feelings, our raw hurts, our sufferings. We can be honest about those before ourselves, before God and before others. And so living that, that unfiltered life. And so today we're talking about how if we have a firm identity in Jesus Christ, it frees us to live that unfiltered life we're talking about and that God desires for us. And so let me show you, this is, uh, this is something that may blow your minds here, but I, I had a bit of an identity crisis and still have a bit of an identity crisis. When I was born, my parents decided to name me after my dad. They wanted to name, my dad's name is Gregory Philip Gifford. And so they decided, as you guys know, my name is Phil, that they decided to name me Gregory Philip Gifford II. And not, not junior, because they didn't want me to be a junior, but Gregory Philip Gifford II. But they never intended to call me Gregory because that would be too confusing to have the same person in the same house, or Greg, so they, they called me Philip. So, so for all growing up, my, my legal name is Gregory Philip Gifford, but my license says Gregory Philip Gifford II, but everybody that knows me and has a relationship with me calls me Phil. And this, this is fine, like, when you're a kid and, and nobody has to deal with you in any sort of legal or official stance, like when friends come over and they're hanging out and you introduce yourself and it's like, oh, hey, Phil, this is Phil, and you have a conversation about that. But when I started to get, like, more and more formal, like going to school and getting a driver's license, going to college, like, they don't know you as Philip anymore or as Phil. They know you by Gregory. So you walk into the MVA, hey, Gregory, you pay your taxes. It's Gregory that pays. And, and I, all throughout high school, I, I corrected my teachers. I, I go by Phil, so no big deal. But I guess just after a bunch of years, I got tired of it. And so when I went to college, in my classes, I thought, ah, they're just for a semester. I'll, I'll let it go. And so they'd call roll, you know, first day of class, Psych 101. Gregory Gifford, are you here? Yep, Greg's here. And so I just went with it. I didn't feel like being that guy in front of the big class. It's actually Phil. So I just went with Gregory. And so that, that became my pattern for my four years of school. Academically, whenever there was a class, I was too shy and too lazy to correct the teacher. So I just went with Greg or Gregory. And then, um, and then when I went back to the dorm room, I was Phil. So from, from 9 to 5, you know, studying classwork, that I'm Gregory or I'm Greg if, they're really, if the teacher's friendly. And then I'd go home, take off that academic hat, and man, Phil's out to party and play. And so two different, not that I really partying and play, I don't even know what that means. And so I would just, it was Phil, not Greg. And so we would, that I would have the split personality. Now that worked for the first couple of years, but the deeper I got into my major with like people in repeated classes, like I had a whole bunch of people that knew me as Greg that I never corrected, and a whole bunch of people that knew me as Phil. And there was one day, my senior year, I was walking from the lunch area, the school cafeteria, and um, some friends from class were walking this way, and I was with friends from my dorm. We walked by and go, hey, Greg, and they kept walking. And my friends were like, who's Greg? Like, who is that? And so all of a sudden, this giant identity crisis comes in because my, I had to explain that I was too shy and lazy to correct people for four years um, that my name was actually not Greg, or nobody calls me that, and it's actually Phil. So I, I had this a bit of identity crisis. Now, when Jackson, our son, was born, you better believe that Greg was not on the table for names. Jackson Philip Gifford is his name. But I, I bring this up for this reason. That little story probably speaks to a bigger story that many of us struggle with on identity. Not about our names, or not about our our, our, our license numbers and all those sorts of things, but, but I believe many of us have an identity issue today. The, and what I mean by that is who we are, the I that we think we are, how we define ourselves, how we identify ourselves, the, the who in our lives, like what makes us us. That is our identity. And so many people have their own version of an identity crisis going on right now. And here's what I mean. 
we, we build our identities on all these external things. We define ourselves on all these external things. Things like our jobs, our families, our financial status, our successes, our grades, our looks, our health, our, our humor, our social status, and maybe a million other things that we use to define our identity. But, but here's what happens. At some point, those external things fail us and let us down, or we have to like press into them all the more. And so maybe you define yourself by your family. My identity is the perfect mom. All my kids are perfectly behaved. And, they, you know, they never, they never wake up late. They always put their shoes on quickly. They're always in the car. And so, like, you, you have this persona that my identity is in my motherhood or my parenting or my home life or my marriage. And so all your Instagram pictures are smiling kids. And, um, oh, I love these kids. It's 3 in the morning. I'm happy to be up with them. You know what I mean? When in reality, like, you're yelling at each other. You're closing your windows so neighbors don't hear you're screaming. Uh, you haven't talked to your spouse in months. But, but the, the image you put forward, the identity you push forward, is one that everything's okay. It's an identity crisis, isn't it? We have one hat we wear that we want people to see, and then we have reality. Or how about if your identity, your identity is in your successes? I'm a, I'm a successful businessman. I'm a successful employee. I'm moving my way up in the company. I've got all this money. I've got better cars than my neighbors. And so like you base your worth and define yourself by your successes. And that you drive yourselves to have the very best, do the very best thing, so everybody looks at you and says, that person is doing well. And you live on that identity. But maybe your bank account doesn't match that identity. And so you dive yourself into credit card after credit card to keep up this false identity that isn't really who you are. And so you see how these identities, when we, when we built our identity on things that, that can't keep up, things that don't last or, or things that are external, they will fail us and we run into this identity crisis. The, the who I am comes crashing down. And so as we think about identi identity from a, from a biblical, God-following standpoint, we have to shift our idea of who we are from external things that we do ourselves to who God says we are in Christ. And when we can begin to see who God says we are and define ourselves not by our stuff and these external things, but by what God says who we are, everything changes. Everything changes. God says that if we know Jesus, if we have a relationship with him, if we follow him, are saved by him, then we have our identity in Christ. And in Christ, our worth, our value, and what defines us doesn't come by the things we do, the things we say, the things that we have, but it comes by what God says and what Christ has done. And so we need to shift our focus from our identity, but to what, is, what does God say about us? And so that's why we're starting here with this service and this sermon on identity, because we can't live unfiltered lives until we find our worth in Jesus Christ. If you find your worth in perfection and or all the other things that you might build your identity on, then, then you can never live an unfiltered life. And so we're going to dive into what does it mean to truly live as Christ would have us live, knowing our worth from him and not from other stuff. And then as we kind of continue on in this series, uh, Larry's speaking next week, and then we're going to jump into some topics like anger. You know, we, those, those raw things that we tend to cover ourselves up with, that filter over, how do we deal with our anger? How do we deal with our anxiety? How do we deal with our, our depression and our doubts and our addictions? Things that we tend to filter up, right? Because we're trying to protect our identity. But God wants us to be honest with him, honest with ourselves, and even honest with others to find healing. So I hope you journey with us these next six weeks as we look at what does it mean to live unfiltered. And today, specifically, as we think about what it means to live in the identity that Christ has for us. And so we're going to be in Colossians, Colossians chapter 3. Well, let me read this verse to you. And I want you to listen to how Christ defines you, but then also what happens when we embrace our identity in him. Like how does embracing our identity change us before Christ and before others? So, so here's the verses. This is Colossians chapter 3, verses 1 through 4. He says this, So if you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. 
Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things, for you died and your life is hidden in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. We read that one more time just to soak it into our lives. So if you have been raised with Christ, like if, if Christ has saved you and raised you, then seek the things that are above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things, for you died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. And when Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Let me ask this question. What does it look like when we embrace our identity in Jesus Christ? Not trying to build a false identity, not trying to create an identity that's not us, but what happens when we let Christ define us? Let's pray together and dive into this. God, thank you again for getting us here, and thank you for just reminding us that it's all about you, that our identity is not in perfection, it's not in the stuff we have, the things working right, the the cleanness of, of our lives. Even this morning, thank you for reminding us that it's not about the, the cleanliness and that everything's working right. It's about you. And so help us to not build our worth on anything other than Jesus Christ and what you say we are through Jesus. I pray and this, this can be a big and, and broad topic and hard to communicate. And so I pray that you help me clearly show how we don't have to build our worth on stuff that we do, but on who Jesus is and what he's done. Help us to see that and help us to, to not just know that, but to, to live it out on a practical level. To let our Mondays be different and our Tuesdays be different and our families be different and our jobs be different so that we don't find ourselves perpetuating the exhausting burden of pulling our own identity, but rather find the rest that you promised in knowing Jesus Christ. God, thank you that we can be in him, that you sent Jesus where we could no longer, we could not live a right life before you. You sent Jesus Christ to forgive us and heal us and uh, forgive our sins and bring us into a new life. Help us now to live in it and to understand it more. It's in Jesus' name we pray all these things. Amen. So how does embracing our identity change us? What does it look like when we embrace our identity? That, that's kind of the big question that we're asking ourselves. And before we really dive into deep into that question, I, I want you just to think through all the things this passage says. And we're going to have it on the screen later on as we walk back through it. But, but we've already read it once. Listen to the things it says about you. If you have a relationship with Jesus, if you know him for salvation, here are the things it says about you. That you have been raised with Christ. Meaning God has given you a new life. So seek the things that are above. It says that you have died and your life is now hidden or protected, secured in Jesus Christ. Meaning that he's got a hold of you and it's okay. Or it says that when Christ, who is your life, appears. In other words, our lives are, are wrapped up in Christ. All of this is identity language. Paul is showing us what happens when a person turns from living for themselves to finding hope and forgiveness in God. That their identity changes. Their, their, their salvation and their hope, their old life is gone and a new life has come. That the brokenness of before is over and there's strength in Christ. And so all of this just speaks to who we are. And here's the reality, that salvation from Jesus comes with an identity in Jesus. That when you are saved by Jesus, there is an identity that comes in Jesus for us. So salvation from Jesus comes with an identity in Jesus. Your life is defined and completed by him. And I want to look at one more other verse, so actually a couple of verses. And this is, this is a bit lengthy, so bear with me here. It's going to be on the screen, and I'm going to go through it fast. But I want you to hear what God says about you in this passage. And this might be the most valuable thing that I say, because it's God's word. But I want you to hear about what God says about you. And uh, here's what it says. This is Ephesians chapter 1, verses 3. He said, Blessed is the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavens in Christ. For he chose us in him before the foundation of the world to be holy and blameless in love before him. He predestined us to be adopted as sons through Jesus Christ for himself 
according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace that he has lavished on us in the beloved one. Verse 7, in him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace, that he richly poured out on us with all wisdom and understanding. He made known to us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure, that he purposed in Christ as a plan for the right time to bring everything together in Christ, both things in heaven and things on earth in him. In him we have received an inheritance, because we are predestined according to the plan of the one who works everything out in agreement with the purpose of his will, so that we who already put our hope in Christ might bring praise to his glory. In him you were also sealed with the promise of the Holy Spirit when you heard the words of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and when you believed, the Holy Spirit is the down payment of our inheritance until the redemption of the possession to the praise of his glorious grace. Now that's a really long verse, verses I just read. You know the funny thing is, if you were reading the New Testament in the, in the language it was originally written in, that's one giant sentence. Like, that's a run-on sentence plus. But it's one giant sentence that talks about you and me and Jesus. That God has blessed us in him. In Christ we're chosen. In Christ we have redemption. In Christ we have an inheritance. And in Christ we are sealed. So basically, the point is, in Christ, everything changes. In Christ, your life changes. My life changes. Our identity changes. We don't have to struggle to find our identity because Christ says, I've got the perfect identity for you. And I'll even say this. Your identity in Jesus is far better than any platform you can struggle to build for yourself. Your identity in Jesus is better than any platform you struggle to build for yourself. That's what Jesus says about you. And so, so what do we do with that? That goes back to our, our question. How do we live out that identity? Maybe some of you know that intellectually, but, but living it out in life is where you struggle with. What does it look like to say, I am in Christ, that's who I am, but how does that change like this lousy job I have to go to on Monday? Or how does that change the, the family fights that I have to deal with every single afternoon when the kids get off the bus? How does that change the fact that my neighbor does this and has this and I don't and I struggle with that? So, so that's why I want to dive into our Colossians passage. That's why I want to look at Colossians chapter 3, verses 1 through 4, where we really see, I think, three key ways that living your identity in Christ changes the way you live your life. And so here's the first thing. Your identity changes what you seek after. That if you find your identity in Christ, then your identity changes what you live for and what you seek. Let me read this Colossians chapter 1 to you again. Listen to this. If you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. So, so if Christ has raised your life, given you new life, then, then live for him. Seek the things that are above. And, and the idea here is what drives you when you get up in the morning? Like what motivates you? What are you seeking the moment your eyes open up and your day begins and you go throughout life? What drives you early in the morning? You know, oftentimes if it's your health, if you're, if you're driven by your health and your physical standing, then, then you're up at 3 a.m. in the gym. You're getting your first two hours of working out before your protein shake at 5 a.m. And you're just working out and working out and you're burning every single calorie and you know what you put in your body. When you are a health identity person, like you are consumed by that or you can be consumed by that. And there's nothing wrong with going to the gym, but when your identity is in your health, if you wake up in the morning, just that's, that's your life. Or when if your identity is in your success, you wake up in the morning and you're driven to go build your empire. You know, burn your family down, burn, the, burn your co-workers down. You're building your empire. So you push for that. You know what, when, you're, when your identity is in your hurt, the pain that's happened to you, you woke up driving to get answers, to get revenge, get whatever it may look like, help others hurt too. So, so something is going to drive you. Something is going to be what pushes you through life. And for, one of, for many of us, it's just the sheer fact that we want to survive. Like, I want to get through the day with my to-do list. And so, so what drives you? What, what is it that, that, that makes you who you are? What are you seeking after? 
And if you don't know that answer, let me, let me challenge you to think about it this way. If you don't know what, what you're seeking after, think about the last time you got really angry. What were you angry about? Like, what is it that angers you? That's often what, what you're seeking after. You know, if you're looking for the perfect family and your kids are in Target and they get to those, those cursed checkout lines with all the things that, that they, they want to grab and like, can I have a Lego? Can I have a pony? Can I have a, can I have a balloon? Can I have a candy bar? And like all of a sudden they start throwing a fit in the middle of the Target and your identity is in your perfect family and you just let your kids have it because they've, not because they're disobeying, but because they've embarrassed you and ruined your image. So what, what angers you is often what you are driving for and seeking for in your lives. And so what Paul is saying here in Colossians chapter 1 is that if you've been raised with Christ, you are to seek the things that are above. You don't have to worry about that stuff. Like what should drive us is not, not the temporary identities that we face during the day, but at a fundamental level, what drives us should be Christ, should be the things that are of God. That should be why we're waking up. And, and the verse here is this, uh, has this idea of a continuous action, that this is an activity we are always doing and always setting ourselves on, that we are always about seeking the things of God. And here's the cool thing. When we seek the things of God, it removes the pull to seek the approval of others. Like when we are about seeking the things of God and, and really don't care about the other stuff, it frees us from the burden of the approval of others. And that's a really good place to be. When we don't have to prove anything and we're focused on God, it, it, it's like an immunization for the, for the approval seeking that we often find ourselves in. So think about your life. What are you seeking? Is, is what you're seeking, does it line up with your identity in Christ? Or does it line up with whatever else you're trying to create for yourself? Here's a second thought. Your identity changes how you think. When you know your identity in Christ, not only does it change what you seek after, but it changes what you think about and how you think and your whole mindset. Look here at verse 2. It says, Set your mind on things above, not on earthly things. Not on earthly things. Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. The, the fact of the matter is, we all have the things we think and dream about all the time. You know, what's the first thing you think about when you, go to the, when you wake up? And what's the last thing you think about when you go to bed? That's what our minds are focused on. What are our first thoughts? What are our last thoughts? What do we go to bed at night thinking about? What are, what are our thoughts focused on? You know, I, I love my son Jackson. He's, uh, he just turned eight last week, and uh, Jackson, he, uh, he, he wouldn't mind me sharing this story at all. Jackson loves all things electronics, which makes him a pretty normal eight-year-old boy. He loves, he loves playing on the iPad. He loves playing on the Kindle. He loves playing on a phone. He loves watching screens. Like anything that has a blue glow, like he's all about. And, and Jackson will go through life with like a singular focus on what is going to get me to be able to play electronics. So he wakes up in the morning and like before he even opens his eyes, he'll come and say, hey, summertime, he's rubbing the stuff out of his eyes. Can I play the iPad? I'm like, dude, I haven't even seen you open your eyes yet. No, you can't play the iPad. And so like during the summer when we had a little more free time with the kids, we, you know, they had, we had rules. Before you could like do any kind of electronic stuff, you had to eat breakfast, you had to get dressed, you had to pick up your room, you had to pick up anything you left out from last night, you had to read for 20 to 30 minutes, and you had to do something creative. And then once you walk through that checklist, then maybe come and ask me if you can watch a cartoon or play electronics. Once you've gone through that litany of things. And so Jackson would like wake up and go do it all. Because he had his mindset, his mind was on things of iPad. And so it wouldn't be uncommon like 6.30, hits the ground running, breakfast, bed, dressed, reading, check, 7.20, daddy, electronics time. I did all my stuff. Well, I said if you do that, maybe you can have permission. But the fact of the matter is just like everything revolves at that thought. It's singularly driven, right? And don't, don't pretend like your kids aren't like that too. And, and, or maybe as an adult, you're not like that. The fact of the matter is we, we drive, we're driven by the things we want. Like we think about the things that, that are part of our identity. And a lot of our identity problems is, is actually a mind problem. That we, we constantly think about the things that we think define us. Our minds are always defining us. 
Let me give you a really practical example. As sad as it, as sad as it is to say, a lot of people find their identity in their pain. Like if you've been hurt or if you're going through brokenness or if you've had suffering in your life, and all of us have at some level, and some of us certainly have more, more noticeable things and harder struggles than others. But a lot of times when you have pain, there's a temptation to find your identity and worth in that pain and brokenness. And so like you're, you're tempted to always think about it or you are, you're tempted to let everybody know about it. It's the first thing you introduce yourself and talk about. It's, 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 you, you, you're tempted to become bitter about it against those that might be hurt you or jealous of those who don't deal with that. And so, so when you're in pain, like your identity is so wrapped around the pain, that's all you can think about. That's all you can think about. And it's so true that your identity is often what drives your thinking. And so if your identity is in Christ, then let him drive your thinking. Let him tell you what to think about. Let him set your mindset, not whatever kind of identity you're trying to create. And let me think, say this pretty clearly. What defines you best is probably what you think about the most. Think about that. Whatever you think about the most is probably what best defines you. And that's scary. Let's be like Paul. Set your minds on things that are above, not on earthly things. We do that through prayer, through knowing God's word, through challenging thoughts that are not in line with what God wants for our lives. But anybody that's dealt with depression and anxiety and worry, and I've had all those things in my life, six months of almost clinical depression, it's a mind game as much as it is anything else. Not to diminish treatment and, and counseling, but it's challenging thoughts all the time. You're always challenging thoughts. Is this true? Is this what God is saying? Is this who I am? You're always changing your thinking and challenging your thinking. So your identity has to change your thoughts. So let's change our thoughts. I love what um, a, a pastor named Craig Groshin, maybe, like Groshel, he says this. If you don't control what you think, you'll never control what you do. If you can't win the battle of the mind, it'll be hard to win the battle of your hearts and your actions. And so let's, let's embrace the mind change. Now here's a third thought. So when you're in Christ, Christ set your things on Christ. But then here's the last thought. Your identity changes why you hope. When your identity is in Christ, it changes why you can hope and how you hope. The last couple of verses, Colossians chapter 3, verse 3. For you died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. So for you died, like you're, and not saying like physically died, but your old life is dead. Your broken life is dead, and now your new life is, is hidden, protected, and secured in Christ. And when Christ appears, you will also see what Christ has done for you. So there's a hope there that, that all that you hope for in Jesus Christ, the plan that God has for you in him, will come true. And so that hope in your identity in Jesus Christ, it, it defines you. And I think you know this, that when you put your hope in the wrong things, it's pretty disappointing. When you hope in things that aren't going to stand up over time, like it's nasty and it's sad. In March, I was having a conversation with one of my mentors about the Orioles. And speaking of hope, and I'm, I'm going with him, like this, guy, this guy's super into the Orioles. He's been a fan for like decades and decades and decades. And I'm, I'm a relatively new fan, uh, maybe six or seven years. So I've kind of came in on their uptick and then still kind of hung holding on. But I remember back in March before they had their first game, we had this conversation. I said, man, I am really hopeful for this season. Like I'm liking what I see with the pitching purchases. I like what I'm seeing with the bat changes and the lineup. Like I think we got a really chance, good chance to be a competitive team this year. Like I'm really hopeful. You know how that hope went away very quickly. Most what? Most losses in the major league history. So if you put your hope in things like the Orioles, it's going to go away. And the same thing is true with your identity. If you put your hope in your identity, it's going to fail you if it's not Jesus. Like your health is not going to last. Your homes are not going to last. Your families are going to change. Your finances might not last. Your successes might be fleeting. 
all these things we put our identity in, that we hope in, can go away so quickly. But this verse says, your life is hidden. It's protected and held by Christ. And it's not even fully seen yet, the hope that you have in him. And so hold to that hope and cling to that hope. Let me try to illustrate it this way as we kind of land this thought. Your identity is going to define you one way or the other. And so, for, so, so, for so many of us, we're trying to pull our identity through our lives. Now, this, this summer, our church plant bought a 5 by 8 trailer. We got, a, like, got an old, kind of a little bit beat up, like used trailer. And um, we wanted to stop renting stuff and save some money and be able to store stuff in it. And so we got this trailer, and I hook it up to my little six-cylinder compact SUV and drag it around all around Abingdon. You probably see me with the old trailer and the, the too small SUV pulling it. And so sometimes when we put a bounce house in there and all these tables and tents, I mean, it's, it's floor to ceiling. This is a heavy trailer. My poor little car, it can feel it. Like you start coming up some of those hills on Singer Road and it's like almost there. Somebody brakes too fast in front of you and your brakes don't work as well as they should. And so pulling this trailer, my poor car, it just it longs for a brake. It loves to be unhitched to just drive like it was meant to be. It loves to not have that burden on it. And, and that's kind of the image I want you to think about when you think about your identity. When we have our identity in the wrong places, it's like we're the, we the car, and we're trying to push through life, pull this identity with us through life. And man, it's, it's burdensome. You're trying to pull the, this perfection through your life. You're trying to, to pull your, your identity through your life. And it's, it's hard. It's wearisome. It's exhausting. You're pulling and pulling and pulling. And it, it just can't be done. It's tiresome. And the problem is that that's, that's not the position we are ever supposed to be in. We are never supposed to be in that part of the story. We get this all backwards. God has designed it not so that we're the driver of our identity, but that he's the driver of our identity. You know, we flip this completely around. We're not supposed to pull our identity. God is our identity, and he pulls us by it. So when we're in Christ, we don't necessarily have to drive our identity. We hitch to Christ, and we have his identity. That's why Jesus says, Come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. Take my yoke upon you, and learn from me, for my yoke is easy, my burden is light. We hitch to him, and it's a completely different thing. His righteousness, not our works. His strength, not our weakness. His hope, not our limited security. It's his agenda, not our selfish drive. We have to continually challenge ourselves. I'm not in the driver's seat. Christ is driving this. and My identity is in him. And so make sure when it comes to your identity that you're in the right spot in this story. You're not trying to drive your identity, force your identity, but rather you are finding your identity in Christ. You know, all these promises and all this hope in Jesus Christ comes by having a relationship with him. The Bible tells us that every single one of us, when we are born, we, we are, we, because of our own what they call sin, things that we do outside of God's plan, have walked away from God one way or the other, big ways, small ways, every single one of us in lots of different ways, we've walked outside of God's plan for our lives. And because of that, we are separated from the relationship we are designed to have with God in him. God cannot have a relationship with us in our brokenness and our sin. But because he loves us and he cares for us and he created us to know him, he sent Jesus Christ, his son, to die on the cross for us. Jesus Christ lived a perfect and sinless life, went to the cross, died for our sins, was buried on the third day, rose again, and says that whoever believes in him should not perish but have life, and have life everlasting. And to have that hope in Jesus Christ, to find our identity in him, we unhitch from ourselves... And we place our hope and our confidence in him. We repent from our sins. We turn to him. And in faith, we believe in him. And we come to him. And this is, this is a decision you make, but it's a lifelong change that you have to live in. To set your mind on things that are above. To seek the things that are of heaven. And to hope in him for eternity. I hope that's a decision you've made. I hope that's a choice you've made for your life. And I hope that that's something practically you can live out every day. Don't fall into the trap of wearily trying to build your own identity. Find your worth in Christ and live it out.